In this lecture, we'll look at the major economic systems that are used by different countries. The choice that the country makes determines how that society will distribute its resources. An economic system describes how a particular society has chosen to distribute its resources to produce goods and services for organizations and for people. A central issue in economics is how to fulfill what is, um, what is assumed to be an unlimited demand for goods and services in a world with limited supply of resources. Although economic systems handle the distribution of resources in different ways, all economic systems must address three important issues. Number one, what goods and services and how much of each of these will satisfy customer needs? Number two, how will goods and services be produced who will produce them and with what resources will they be produced and number three how are the goods and services being uh, how the goods and services going to be distributed among the various consumers or organizations that purchase goods and services in the economy those are the three main questions and economic system answers let's look at these three types of economies one by one Communism was first described by Karl Marx as a society in which the people, without regard to class, own all of the nation's resources. Everybody owns them together. Today, there are a few countries that are considered to be communistic, but there are no true communist economies that exist today that satisfy this ideal that Marx put on paper. The communist, communism appears to be efficient and equitable on paper, producing less of a gap between rich and poor. In practice, however, communist economies have been marked by low standards of living, critical shortage of consumer goods, high prices, of high prices, corruption, and individual freedoms tend to be curtailed. Some of these societies would include China and Cuba. In other words, the desire to distribute resources efficiently so people can be motivated and uh, and achieve their own personal objectives, all of those seem to be less than optimally supported within this communist structure, economic structure. Socialism is an economic system in which the government owns and operates basic industries, like, for example, postal service, telephone system, utilities, transportation, health care, banking, some manufacturing, but individuals own most other businesses like uh, restaurants, uh, beauty parlors, uh, those kinds of, uh, of operations. Um, most socialist nations are democratic and they recognize basic, basic individual freedoms. Social e economies generally uh, profess a kind of egalitarianism, whereas equal distribution of income and social services trying to reduce cat class differences. They believe that economies are more stable than those with other, of other nations. That is, the, the, the socialist thing keeps their, their, their country uh, more stable. Although this may be true, taxes and unemployment are generally high in socialist countries. Um, examples of some that we uh, that are existing today are Sweden, Israel, and India. Uh, various companies where the uh, government owns like these big industries, as and and, and operates these big industries, um, as we described. Capitalism or free enterprise is an economic system in which individuals own and operate the majority of businesses that provide goods and services. Competition, supply and demand, uh, these are the things that determine which goods and services are, are produced, how they are produced, and how they're distributed. Some of the company, countries that are in this category include Australia and Canada, as well as uh, the, the comp uh, countries like United States and Japan, uh, free market capitalism. Um, there are really two kinds of capitalism. As I was saying before, this sort of a free market capitalist system is one that is basically unconstrained and the modified capitalism. Uh, stepping back again, 
in pure capitalism, that is the quote, free market system, all of the economic decisions are made without government intervention. This was described by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. Uh, he's the father of capitalism who said that the invisible hand of competition best regulates the economy. Uh, this is called laissez-faire capitalism. Let me let it be laissez-faire, let it be. In other words, keep your hands off of it, just let it run. And somehow this invisible hand will allocate resources effectively. And we'll talk a lot more about this uh, particular assumption and what it really means as we go forward. But that this implies the government should not interfere because interference by government with regulations would always create some sort of a friction in this uh, otherwise efficient capital or efficient market system. Um, and, and we'll talk more about how realistic such an assumption is. Modified capitalism differs from pure capitalism in that the government intervenes and regulates business to some extent. One of the ways in which the United States and Canada governments regulate their business is through some of their laws. Mixed economies is where countries use some of different elements of various economies in order to construct sort of a customized presentation of their economic system. In fact, no country really practices any, a pure form of any of these, communism, socialism, or capitalism. Although most tend to favor one system over others, most nations operate as mixed economies with elements of all three of these in, or not all three of them, or at least one of the, one other system as well as the main economic system that they have incorporated. In socialist Sweden, for example, most businesses are owned and operated by private individuals. However, in capitalist United States, uh, there's an independent federal agency that operates the Postal Service, and as we most of us know, most of the transit systems in cities and, um, and regions in the United States is also run by, uh, by government agencies. Countries such as China and Russia use state capitalism to advance their economy. Uh, state capitalism integrates the power of the state with the advantages of capitalism. It's also led by the government some of these businesses are led by the government, but they use capitalist tools such as they might list state-owned enterprises, companies on a stock market, and they would embrace capital uh, globalization in terms of trade, etc. Um, even though there's a state-owned business that is being uh, having having many of its decisions supported by or not by uh, supported by supported or not by capital markets, which would help give them some direction about where they should take their organizations going forward. So many of these economies are come together in ways that allow different aspects of the, the different three, three main economic systems to be utilized to optimize their, their own national economy. Modified capitalism differs from pure capitalism in that the government intervenes in the markets and regulates businesses to some extent. One of the ways in which the United States and Canadian governments regulate businesses, business is through laws. Laws such as the Federal Trade Commission Act was created by, created this organization called the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, to enforce antitrust laws. That makes, make, not make sure companies don't get too large and ensure competition. It's also the, the Food and Drug Administration and various kinds of administrations that look into market exchanges and try to limit or limit the sorts of extreme behaviors that markets might sometimes have. Um, this illustrates the importance of some level of government in the economy. So the, the general argument isn't if the government intervenes, but it's more how and to what degree does government intervention in, to, to help uh, help improve market performance, not in terms of value, but in terms of what resources are delivered to whom, safety concerns and the like, uh, how much of that versus when is it too much? And that's where the disagreement in the political system um, most often occurs. 
the many economies, including the United States and Canada and Japan, are based on free enterprise, this underlying free enterprise system, different a little bit than free markets, where you stay out of the markets. Free enterprise means you grant personal freedoms to businesses and individuals. Many communist and socialist countries, such as China, are China and Russia are starting to apply more principles from free enterprise to their own economic systems. Essentially, free enterprise allows a company to succeed or fail based upon market demand. That is, if they sell more, they survive. If they sell less, they don't survive. Companies can efficiently manufacture and sell consumers, sell products to consumers, whatever they desire. They'll probably succeed but those companies that don't manage to do that will probably fail. An entrepreneur presents his idea for a new product. Entrepreneurs are more productive in a free enterprise system because they can make choices about what to provide and therefore they can innovate and really change the dynamics of the marketplace. A number of basic individual rights must exist for free enterprise to work. These rights are the goals of countries that have embraced free enterprise. Organizations or structures try to be put into place that support these objectives. Number one, individuals have to have the right to own property and pass this property on to heirs. That the right, this right motivates people to work hard during their lifetimes, to save, to buy things, and develop them over time. A motivation to grow your own nest egg, if you will. Individuals and businesses must have the right to earn profits and then use those profits as they wish. With, this is, of course, within the constraints of the society's laws and principles. And this is where the notion of how much taxation do you need, do you apply, if there's too much taxation, you start to limit this notion of individuals being able to use the profits the way they want to. Individuals and businesses must, have, must be able to make their own decisions, how they want to decide what, how, what, how to use their resources and how to determine how their business should operate. Although there's government regulation, the philosophy in countries like the United States and Australia is to minimize regulation and maximize the individual freedom within a set of rules of fairness that the society agrees are necessary to hold their so social fabric together. Number four, individuals must choose, uh, must have the right to choose the career they like to pursue, where they want to live, what goods and services to purchase and more. This is what allows free markets to work because people can move if they can't get what they need. Um, they can choose to purchase things or not, which helps drive more efficient pricing depending upon what they need. So the resources get distributed efficiently in the society. Business must have the right to choose where to locate, what goods and services to produce, and what resources to use in the production process, and so on. Without these rights, businesses really can't function effectively as a free enterprise because they're not really motivated to succeed. Thus, these rights, individual and business rights, make possible the open exchange of goods and services and effective pricing, which we'll talk about later or in the next couple lectures. In the next lecture, in fact, we'll get more specific about this underlying notion that is in microeconomics of supply and demand and how important that is to driving prices and what prices are really doing for the economy. That'll be in the next lecture.